This evening we continue our 66 books series, and we are in the book of Romans tonight. So take out your Bible and turn to the book of Romans. We get to spend the next 51 minutes looking at my favorite book. It has to, it has to stop at 51 minutes. If you were to sit down and read the book of Romans, it may take you 60 minutes, 90 minutes, 45 minutes, depending on how fast you read, but I would encourage you to make an attempt at reading this letter all in one sitting. It is, in fact, a letter. It is a letter from the Apostle Paul to believers gathered at Rome. And when Paul wrote the letter to the Romans, probably from Corinth in 62 to 65 AD, while he was on a missionary journey that is recorded in Acts chapter 20, he wrote a letter to a group of Christians that he had never met. He had not yet been to Rome. And he sought to see them established and strengthened in the gospel. And some have said that Paul wrote the letter to the Romans as something of a missionary support letter writing to a, an outpost of believers at the heart of the Roman Empire as Paul sought to take the gospel outward from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. He sought to get to Rome and past Rome to places the gospel had never yet been. I want you to see the purpose of Paul's writing uh, near the end of the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 15, Paul, speaking about his role as an apostle to the Gentiles, he records in verse 19 of chapter 15 that in the power of signs and wonders, those are the things that marked him out as an apostle in addition to being an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ. In the power of the Spirit, from Jerusalem and round about as far as Illyricum, that's modern day Albania, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Not that everybody in those regions had come to faith in Christ, but Paul's preaching of Christ meant the preaching of the gospel, the making of disciples, even the establishment and installment of qualified leaders in local churches so that those local churches could reach the gospel further in those areas. Paul's apostolic ministry was thorough and robust in all of those areas. And in verse 20, he says, I aspire to preach the gospel not where Christ has already been named, so that I would not build on another man's foundation. Verse 22, he says, I have often been prevented from coming to you, again, speaking to the believers at Rome, but now with no further place for me in these regions, and since I have had for many years a longing to come to you, whenever I go to Spain, for I hope to see you in passing and to be helped on my way there by you when I have first enjoyed your company for a while. Verse 28, therefore, when I have finished this and have put my seal on this fruit, I will go on by way of you to Spain, and I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. So Paul longs to see these believers who are, who are at Rome. He names many of them by name. He tells them he's been praying for them incessantly. He can't wait to see them, and he's not staying long. It's an interesting, affectionate letter. And Paul's hope is that by going to Rome and meeting with them personally, they can help him get beyond Rome to places the gospel has not yet gone. That is why some see this as something of a missionary support letter. If we were to ask the question, why did Paul write Romans? I believe Paul wrote Romans to establish a clear proclamation of the gospel in this letter to the Roman believers to assure them that he's preaching the same gospel that saved them. So that when he gets there, they have it in fullness and in clarity and can join in the support of the Apostle Paul as he takes that very same gospel beyond their regions. I think that's why Paul writes the gospel, or excuse me, writes the letter to the Romans. And if we were to back up and ask, why did God write the letter to the Romans? We recognize there are two authors of this book, God the Holy Spirit penning through the Apostle Paul and Paul writing for his own purposes. Uh, those, odds are not, or those purposes are not at odds with one another. But I believe in the providence of God, the Holy Spirit has given us in one letter a complete take on the gospel. 
we get in this one place in our Bibles a thorough, logical, developed argumentation of the gospel itself from beginning to end. Essentially, the, the gospel, the good news, answering the question, how is a sinner to be made right before a holy God and that holy God maintain his holy reputation? How can God forgive sin? Is answered by the letter to the Romans in full detail. Paul gives the gospel in this letter. Martin Luther said, this letter to the Romans is the chief part of the New Testament and the very purest gospel, which indeed deserves that a Christian should not only know it word for word by heart, but deal with it daily as with the daily bread of the soul. For it can never be read or considered too much or too well, and the more it is handled, the more delightful it becomes, and the better it tastes. Have you had Martin Luther's experience with the book of Romans? You come back to this letter time and again, and there is more to see. And I would commend to you the, the lofty practice of memorizing the book of Romans. Martin Luther said every Christian should do it. And so I would just pass along that advice to all of us this evening. Let me give you my summary of the theme of the letter to the Romans. Uh, it is simply this, God gives his righteousness to those who believe so that they can enjoy rather than be incinerated by the glory of God. God gives his righteousness to sinners who believe so that they can enjoy rather than be incinerated by the glory of God. That is what this letter is all about. And what I want to do this evening is just walk through Paul's logical development of the gospel, the good news of how sinners are to be made right before a holy God. Uh, let's begin in Romans chapter 1. Paul introduces himself, introduces himself to his readers, and then expresses that desire in verse 11, I long to see you so that I may impart to you spiritual gift so that you may be established. And chapter 1, verse 11 serves as a front-end, book-end of the gospel, uh, the stated purpose of Paul to, to see the gospel firmly establish the Roman believers. And then when you get to chapter 16, verse 25, this doxology at the pen of Paul is, now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. What do we see there? Paul seeks to establish the Roman believers in the gospel, and then he prays at the end of the letter to the God who is able to establish you in the gospel. This is a remarkable recognition of dependence on grace and divine power. It's not as if Paul, by his own strength or his own power, could accomplish anything good. He recognizes even the things he sets his heart to must have divine help if they were to accomplish eternal things. So Paul sets out to explain the gospel, and he begins the good news, frankly, with the bad news. Look at verse 15, he says, For my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are at Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, then to the Greek for in it, that is in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven. That whole chain from I am not ashamed to all the explanatory statements all the way down to the wrath of God is being revealed gives the basis for why Paul develops the logical argumentation of the gospel in this letter. And let's just work it backwards, if we can, for a little bit. The wrath of God is being revealed against heaven. I mean, from heaven against the ungodliness of men on the earth. That is why men need righteousness. Men need the righteousness of God. They don't have righteousness of their own. They, they live in unrighteousness. And men need to have God's standard of righteousness... God's acquisition of righteousness in order to meet God's standard of righteousness. And that is why, according to verse 17, they need the gospel. 
because only in the gospel is the righteousness of God manifested or made known or given or delivered. And that is why, according to verse 15, Paul is not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because the gospel contains the righteousness you need. Well, why do I need righteousness? Because of wrath. Why is there wrath? Because of my ungodliness. And that sets up the entire argument of the letter to Romans. Of course, this wrath of God is unfolded from uh, chapter 1, verse 18 and following. The wrath of God is presently being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress truth in unrighteousness. This gets at the fundamental human problem. Paul details here that there is no one who does not know that God exists. Everyone knows that God exists. Everyone knows that there are categories of right and wrong. But what do men do with the knowledge of God? External in nature, internal in the human heart. Paul says they suppress that truth in unrighteousness. Why are we uncomfortable with the truth? Because the truth indicts us. It tells us we have a problem. And if you don't understand the problem, you will never get to the solution. And the problem is much bigger than that sinners do sinful things. The great big problem is the righteousness of God. The great big problem is that our lives do not live up to the standard God demands. What does that look like? Verse 21, even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God, nor did they give thanks to Him, but their foolish hearts were darkened. They claimed to be wise, but they became fools. They exchanged the glory of God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Verse 24 tells us that God responds to man's suppression of truth by giving man exactly what he wants. You want the truth buried in a box and you sit on the lid and you don't have access to it? Okay, God gave them over Verse 24, in the lusts of their heart to impurity for the degrading of their bodies. And they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator. Okay, you want to you worship created things rather than the creator. For this reason, verse 26, God gave them over to degrading passions. And in verse 28, we see another, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not be done. And then you have this vice list from verse 29 to the end. They are filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. God haters. They disobey their parents. They are unloving, unmerciful, unworthy, without understanding. They know God's righteous ordinances, that people who do such things deserve death. But they not only continue to do them, but also approve of those who practice them. And Paul here in Romans chapter 1 indicts the entirety of the Gentile world. This is the expression of total depravity. Not only that every sinner on the earth is a sinner by nature and a sinner by activity and therefore an offense to a holy God, but every capacity of man is infected by sin. Paul isn't content with dealing only with the Gentile world or the irreligious, those who openly worship idols. In chapter 2, Paul moves on to the religious or, or the Jew. Look what he says there. Therefore, you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment. For in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself, because you who judge practice the same things. You might have thought you were off the hook in chapter 1 if you were religious, if you didn't worship idols, if you didn't give yourself over to degrading passions, if you lived a straight life. But see, external religious conformity is not the standard that God demands. So in chapter 2, Paul has the, the Jew and the religious man and the morally upright man and the crosshairs of the bad news. He says in verse 3, do you suppose that when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and you do the same yourself that you'll escape God's judgment? Or do you think lightly of his tolerance, kindness, and patience, not knowing that God's kindness has as its goal your repentance, 
And look at verse 5. Because of your stubbornness and unrepented heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when His righteous judgment will be revealed. This is a stunning scene. Jonathan Edwards has compared verse 5 to something like a dam holding back a great body of water. And every time a sinner sins, it's as if he's throwing more water behind the dam. And the dam holding back this great torrential flood that would destroy the sinner. The dam holding that back is God's mercy, God's patience, God's tolerance. And there is time to repent. But one day that patience will run out. The dam will burst. And all of the sins committed against God in an era of patience will come spilling out in a torrent of God's wrath. It's an interesting word picture. Your stubbornness and unrepented heart, you're storing up more wrath for yourself, against yourself, for the day of God's wrath. And then look at verse 7. To those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, there will be eternal life. But to those who are selfish and ambitious and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and indignation, trouble and distress for every soul of man who does evil, to the Jew first, also to the Greek, glory, honor, and peace to everyone who does good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, there is no partiality with God. What is God saying here? He will render to every man according to what he has done. And if you do good, you get to have eternal life. And if you do evil, punishment. Now, at face value, these verses right here may sound like a wrong gospel. I hope hope the wording of that sounds like a wrong gospel to you. Some have argued that these verses are saying, well, a genuine Christian will do what is right. And so the justified one is justified by grace alone through faith alone, but then works out that justifying faith in deeds that are rewarded. I don't think that's what Paul's talking about here. Although that is theologically true, Christians who are saved by faith, who live under the reign of grace, will live out a grace that teaches us to deny ungodliness. But I think these verses here in this portion of the letter to the Romans are a setup. If you do good, eternal life. If you do evil, condemnation. Where does Paul go next in the book of Romans? To chapter 3. And there he describes precisely how many people do good. Do you remember it? No, not one. In case we misunderstood the indictment of the Jews in Romans 2, the indictment of the Gentile world in Romans 1, we come now to Romans 3, and Paul makes it clear, not only are Gentiles sinners in need of a Savior, and Jews sinners in need of a Savior, but in case there was anybody left out, Jew, Gentile, everybody, all y'all are sinners. Look what he says, beginning in verse 10. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. With their tongues they practice deceit. The poison of vipers is under their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes." This litany of Old Testament texts to take you through the whole sweep of the human constitution makes it very clear that every single human being, Jew and Gentile alike, are plagued by the disease called sin. They're all under condemnation. And we come perhaps to some hope, verse 19. What about the law? The law of God is good, and and maybe the law of God can help me. I've done dirty deeds. I, I need to do good deeds. Look at verse 19. We know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world held accountable to God. 
Do you see what Paul's saying there? If you were hoping that the solution to the problem of sin was do-gooding, give me some rules and I'll keep them. That's my life preserver. Just throw me that life preserver and, and I'll work it out. That's not the function of the law, according to Paul in verse 19. The law speaks to everyone under it to shut everyone's mouth. To hold the whole world accountable to God. What does the law put forward? The the law of God puts forward the righteous standard of God. And do you remember how the letter began? What was the point of the gospel? To bring about a righteousness. To bring about God's own righteousness to those who believe. Verse 20. By works of law, no flesh will be justified. The key word here in the letter of the Romans Justified is to put something forward as just or right or righteous. No flesh can be justified in God's sight by law. Why? Because through law comes knowledge of sin. We'll get into this a little more when we get to Romans chapter 7. But the function of the law is not to help you out of your sin problem. The law reveals how deep the problem goes. Here comes the gospel, the good news, verse 21. And this section here, from verse 21 to verse 25, is the densest section of vocabulary related to the cross work of Christ anywhere in Scripture. There are a bunch of great big college words here that are in our English Bibles that we need to know. And and they're all packed tightly. And together they make this multifaceted picture of what Jesus did at the cross. Listen to this, but now, contrast to Gentiles are bad guys, chapter one, Jews are bad guys, chapter two, everybody's a bad guy, chapter three, law won't help. But now, verse 21, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been manifested. God's going to give his righteousness somehow. And this giving of his righteousness is actually witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, notice this, through faith. That's the key. How will God put someone forward as just or righteous? As one who meets the perfect standard of his righteousness? By their law keeping? No way. But by faith faith in Jesus the Messiah for all those who believe. There's no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Messiah Jesus. Okay, this is a mouthful of grace words. Listen to this statement. Um, Everyone who believes... By the way, the all have sinned in verse 23, while that is a true statement of all of humanity, I believe the all here is confined to the believers and the justified right here in the context. The the righteousness of God is available to all the believers, no distinction, for all of them have sinned, all of them fell short of the glory of God, and all of them are justified. The same all governs all of these verbs. And they are justified or put forth as righteous as a gift by His grace. Back-to-back ways to say grace. As a gift by God's free gift through the redemption. The redemption is that word to purchase a slave out of the slave market, to pay a price, to ransom someone out of slavery. This grace through the redemption which is in Messiah Jesus, the promised one, Jesus of Nazareth, the the God-man, whom God displayed publicly, verse 25, as a propitiation. Propitiation, another big college word. It simply means the satisfaction of divine wrath by a substitute. It means God is very angry at sin. And someone went in between God's infinite anger and us, the sinner, and absorbed every ounce of that anger so that what is left after the intermediary substitute takes all of the wrath is not one ounce or drop of wrath left for the believing sinner. It is a complete and total absorption of all the anger 
and this changes God's disposition towards the sinner. All of his just and righteous wrath goes out on Christ, and there is none left for the sinner. This was to demonstrate God's righteousness, because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed, the demonstration of his righteousness at the present time, so that God would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. This gets down to the very bottom of God maintaining his own integrity as just and righteous and holy and forgiving sinners who are definitely guilty. An earthly judge who let a criminal go would not be considered a good judge. Justice must be met. The righteous standard must be adhered to. And the only way God can be both just himself and a putting forth of sinners as righteous, a justifier, is if that holy justice goes somewhere. Crime for crime, sin for sin, one for one accounting. This is why as Christians, we don't believe in a a Santa Claus who winks his eyes and lets bygones be bygones. We believe in a holy and just God whose justice and full righteousness must be accounted for and an infinite Savior, infinite in His personage, who can actually take all of God's righteous wrath, absorb it completely so that the sinner goes free. This is substitution, Jesus in our place. Verse 27, where then is boasting? Should seem like an obvious question at this point. No one at this point could say, oh yes, I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps. I was smart enough one day to figure this out. I cleaned up my act. I outweighed my bad deeds with a bunch of good deeds. Nobody can boast about anything coming to Christ, coming to the gospel. This is God's work through and through. What's fantastic about the gospel and and near and dear to Paul's heart is the leveling that grace does between ethnicities. Jew and Gentile both get direct access to God through Messiah Jesus. Chapter 4 of Romans gives us an example of justification by faith. And Paul goes to the Old Testament. He uses Abraham as the example. And and listen to the way this is set up. Verse 4. To the one who works, his wage is not credited as favor or grace, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes God who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. What is Paul saying there? You go to work, you put in your hours, you get a paycheck. You get paid for what you do. You're not getting grace. You're not getting favors. You're getting what's owed. God will owe no man. If any sinner gets saved, it is purely an act of God's grace, His favor, totally unmerited. And when we smuggle in works into the equation, we mess up the gospel. It's no longer grace. The gospel is good news because it provides the righteousness that God demands While God gets to maintain his holy reputation, the sinner gets to go free, and it only comes by believing the gospel. Abraham is the example. In the Old Testament, here was one who believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, this statement in Romans 4, 5, that that God declares righteous the ungodly, is the gospel in a nutshell. Abraham was not picked because he was godly, because he had God's righteousness inherently. He was a pagan idolater. He was an adult. uh, He was a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? He had multiple wives. Polygamist. And in his history of polygamy and, and idolatry, he was not even looking for God's favor. God was just kind to him, made declarations to him, And Abraham believed God. Belief is credited as righteousness. After the illustration of Abraham, we get to the fruits of justification beginning in chapter 5. Notice the therefore 
in chapter 5, verse 1, having been justified by faith, we possess peace with God. This is a remarkable statement. Justification here is said to be something that has happened in the past for believers with continuing results into the present, and now we currently, in an ongoing way, possess peace with God. The implication of that is we were at war. There was enmity. There was enmity, anger from God towards us, hostility from us, the sinner, towards God. And here, God has brought a ceasefire by His own grace, and He has made peace for us with Him. There are more fruits of justification. Look at verse 2. We have obtained an introduction by faith into grace in which we now stand. The Christian life, grace is not just the front door. Grace is the banner over the whole thing. In fact, by the end of chapter 5, we'll talk about and see the reign of grace which defines the Christian life. Notice how this grace, uh, this introduction to grace brings other things. Hope in verse 2, exaltation in tribulations, verse 3, perseverance, proven character, hope, And then we see in verse 5, the love of God. Why is persecution, tribulation, hope, perseverance not disappointing? Because we are loved, Christian. The love of God has been poured out within our hearts, verse 5, through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And then the love of God is described in such uh, marvelous detail. God did not love us because we were lovely. Notice verse 6, while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. God demonstrates His own love toward us, verse 8, in that while while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from His wrath. If we were loved by Him when we were enemies, how much more, having been reconciled through the death of His Son, shall we be ultimately saved in his life. The rest of chapter 5 deals with the, the difference between our solidarity in Adam and our solidarity in Christ. You and I were born in a miserable state. We inherited the sin nature of our parents and their parents and their parents and their parents and their parents all the way back to Adam. And so when we sin, Nobody has to teach us how to sin. We sin out of our nature. And we were in a solidarity not only with Adam, but with the entirety of the human race in a predicament of inextricable slavery to sin. We couldn't get ourselves out. We were slaves to sin. We were attached to law. That's a very bad combination, by the way. If all you can do is sin and you're attached to a set of rules that condemn you for sinning, That's a hopeless condition. And from Adam on, the entire human race was locked in that solidarity. And there's a remarkable contrast between the the great awfulness of what Adam did and how we're all stuck in solidarity with him and the great beauty of what Christ did. Look at verse 12. There's a just as at the beginning of verse 12. Just as through one man... Sin entered into the world, and death entered through sin, and I believe that's spiritual death, and so that spiritual death spread to all men, on account of which everybody sinned. Just as that happened, the even so comes all the way down to verse 18. Paul does one of these rabbit trail digressions for a little bit. Just as all of this happened through one man, Adam, Verse 18, even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification. And so all who are in Christ get out of the solidarity with Adam and are placed into a solidarity with Jesus. Verse 19, as through one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. It's a remarkable transformation to go from being in Adam, constituted a sinner by nature, to now being in Christ, 
totally undeserved, a fruit of justification, a benefit of the gospel. Look at verse 20, law came in so that transgression would increase, and where sin increased, grace superabounded, so that just as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That word for reign is the verb form of the, of the noun king. You think about this, sin was king, reigned as king, or sin kinged in the dominion or the realm of death. Characterized by death, started in spiritual death, the result is eternal death. There is a, a, a realm of death over which sin is king. That's where we used to live. And now, under the reign of grace, there is righteousness leading to eternal life. To be in the gospel, to be in Christ, is to have been removed from the reign of sin and to be placed under the reign of grace. And everything that flows out of the rest of of Romans comes under the banner of the reign of grace. Chapter 6 details what the reign of grace does to us in our relationship to sin. Chapter 7 details what the reign of grace does for us in our relationship to law. And then chapter 8 details what it is like under the reign of grace to live with the Spirit indwelling. Let's start first with that relationship to sin. In Romans chapter 6, we discover that we have been crucified with Christ. We are joined to Christ in His death, buried with Him into death, and raised to new life by the Spirit. This is a remarkable statement. According to Romans 6, we were slaves of sin. And when a slave had a slave master, the slave master told him what to do. But if the slave died, the slave master couldn't tell him what to do. He had no more authority any longer. That's the picture here. Christian, when you became a believer, you died and your death union with Christ severed your relationship to that old slave master's sin so that sin couldn't be king anymore. Uh, This is what it means to be under the reign of grace. Verse 14 of Romans 6, Sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law but under grace. Remarkable statement. And this comes on the heels of Paul's questions. So if we're under grace, does that mean we just do whatever we want and and we sin all the time? No, you're no longer a slave of sin. Your identity is different. You, You have a new master. You have a different way of operating. You are now under the dominion of grace. Romans 6 ends with the idea of us being slaves to God. Look at verse 22. Having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you now derive benefit, resulting in sanctification and the outcome eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. To become a Christian, to be placed under the reign of grace, is to be taken out of the solidarity with Adam and all of humanity under the tyranny of sin and death. To actually die to that spiritual death. And in that death union with Christ, be freed from slavery to sin. If you're a Christian, you're not a slave of sin. Romans chapter 7 goes on with the reign of grace and describes our relationship to the law. The first half of the chapter describes what the law can do. What is the law for? God's law, in whatever age, whatever set of rules he governs his people by, the point of God's law is to lay out the standard by which he seeks to regulate his people. And then the law has the ability to actually aggravate sin in the heart to transgress the law and then condemn sinners for having transgressed the law. That is the law's purpose. Uh, The the law does not have the ability to make the sinner do what's right. It's like the sign on the newly planted winter grass that says, stay off the lawn. The, The sign doesn't have the ability physically to keep you off the grass. In fact, it might provoke in your heart the desire to, to rip that sign out of the grass, snap it over to your leg, and go stomp on the grass because the problem is the sin in my heart. No problem with the sign. Sign was clear. The font was good. 
the, the, the stick was sturdy, the problem is me. And as long as a sinner is under the reign of death and a slave of sin, if he's married to law, that ball and chain means death. It can only bring about, here's the standard, provoke you to violate the standard, aha, you broke the standard, now you're condemned. That's what law can do. That's why law can't save. And look, it's good for God to regulate the lives of his people. The law itself is good, but being married to the law while a slave of sin is not good for a sinner. And so your death union with Christ frees you from slavery to sin, and it severs the marriage to law. So that now you are united to God through grace. It's a really remarkable equation. Paul then in the second half of the chapter describes from the perspective of his own life as a law lover and law keeper from a human vantage point. Remember in Philippians 3, he said, as to the law, I was blameless. This is one who loved the law of God from the heart as an unbeliever. And looking back on that unbelieving life, he describes what it was like. There was something I wanted to do and I couldn't do it. There was something I aspired to and I wasn't capable of and and the things I did do, I hated. Paul's conscience was informed by the law of God which was good. And yet apart from the reign of grace, he had no ability to keep it. What's fascinating about uh, the, the, the Paul, Paul's autobiography there in the second half of Romans 7, he, he's made it clear in chapter 6 that if you're a slave of sin, you're not a Christian. And then he describes in this autobiographical look back, I am sold as under bondage into sin. And then in Romans chapter 8, he will say, if you are of the flesh, you are not a Christian. And in the second half of Romans 7, in Paul's autobiographical look back, he says, I am a flesh. He claims to be fleshy and a slave of sin in this section. I do not believe Paul is speaking as a believer here. I believe Paul is speaking as a believer, looking back on his life as an unbeliever under the good law of God, unable to keep it. And what would set him free? from that tragic situation of being a slave of sin under the tyranny of sin and death while married to God's law? Only one thing can set you free. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Look at chapter 8, verse 1. There is thou therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because the law of the Spirit of life sets you free from the law of sin and death. What the law could not do Weak as it was through flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to flesh, but according to spirit. And what happens in the rest of this chapter is the details of what it means to be a Christian with a new relationship to God by the Spirit. Chapter 6, new relationship to sin. Chapter 7, new relationship to the law. Chapter 8, new relationship to God as Father by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of adoption. And it begins with the no condemnation statement in verse 1, and it ends with the no separation statement at the end of the chapter. And everything in between, you have the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. What does the Holy Spirit do? Teaches us to deny ungodliness, specifically leads us to put to death the deeds of the body, right in accordance with the reign of grace. The reign of grace is not a free-for-all, now sin however you want. The reign of grace, through righteousness, leads to eternal life. That is exactly what the Holy Spirit's presence in the life of the believer does. Look at verse 13. If you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And we see there that the Holy Spirit of God in the life of the believer produces a filial affection to God. That is a a father-son relationship to God. I cry out, Daddy or Abba, Father, because the Holy Spirit dwells in the heart. 
The Holy Spirit actually grants a subjective assurance that you belong to God by adoption. And there are tangible, objective markers of the Holy Spirit's presence, putting to death the deeds of the body. We also find here that the Holy Spirit intercedes in prayer. He fixes our prayers on the way up. He knows our hearts and He knows the will of God. And He adjusts with wordless groans the prayers that we pray in weakness and lack of knowledge. The magnificent Romans chapter 8 ends with this remarkable anthem. We overwhelmingly conquer through God who loved us. I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What happens in Romans 9 to 11 is a demonstration of the integrity of God backing up that promise. God promises no condemnation and no separation for all who are loved by Him and are found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then we get a problem as we start to think about Israel. I mean, Israel got promises in the Old Testament and they seem to be separated from Messiah. They're, they, they don't believe. And Paul answers the question about whether God's word is reliable three different ways in these chapters. We talked about it a little bit this morning in equipping hour. Uh, the three answers to the question about God's integrity are first of all, not every Jew is a believer. Secondly, God always keeps a remnant of believing Jews in every generation. And thirdly, there's a coming generation, still future, where God will save the entire Jewish nation through the gospel. They will be justified by faith alone in the finished work of Christ alone. That day's coming. The problem of Israel is no problem for God or his integrity or the promises of the gospel. In fact, the promises to Israel that God will keep and fulfill are an inducement for us to trust God. If God says there's no condemnation and there's no separation for those who are in Christ, we can bank on those promises precisely because God keeps all the promises that he makes. The effect of the illustration that Paul gives in Romans 11 for the relationship between the church and Israel, we talked about this again this morning in equipping hour, Israel has something of a dual status, according to Romans 11, 28. For the church's sake, they are enemies of the gospel because they don't believe. And yet for the sake of the fathers, they are beloved. In other words, God's going to keep his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How can somebody be both an enemy of the gospel and beloved as a nation? Uh, that's the dual status of Israel. And you, this illustration of the two olive trees, Israel is compared to a natural olive tree cultivated in the garden, cared for by God. And there are branches cut off of that tree, branches cut off because of their unbelief, lying there on the ground. And other branches from wild olive trees, Gentiles, are cut off out of their trees and brought over and grafted in to the rich root of the olive tree, which is Israel. In other words, Gentiles get to participate in the spiritual blessings promised to Israel. So that Gentiles, standing in the promises that God made, say, what am I doing here? It is only by God's mercy that I have been grafted into His grace. I get to participate in Israel's Messiah. I get my sins forgiven. This is too good to be true. That should be the response of every Gentile. And I get that we've lost the flavor of that over the last 1900 years. Most of the church is populated by Gentiles. But could you imagine what it would have been like as a Gentile reading this letter for the first time? I'm crafted in by mercy. I don't belong there. And then those branches uh, cut off, lying on the ground for unbelief over the centuries. Paul says it is easy for God to graft back in those natural branches and they will be grafted in by faith and repentance. And what happens then? No Jew at that time will say, I'm in here because I'm Abraham's children. Remember what Jesus said about that? God can raise up children of Abraham from the rocks. <laughs> 
they will say, I was cut off for unbelief and I don't deserve the gospel. This is all of mercy so that Jews who get in and Gentiles get in are all on equal footing with the gospel. They've been leveled by total depravity and they've been leveled and humbled by gospel grace. And then everyone cries out the doxology in Romans 11. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has become His counselor? Who has given to Him that it might be paid back to Him again? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. And this doxology is the apex of Paul's description of the gospel. Gentiles are sinners. Jews are sinners. Everybody's a sinner. And the only way sinners get reconciled to God is if Jesus dies in our place as a propitiation of his wrath. That's true of all ages. Abraham's an example. David's an example, both in chapter 4. To be declared righteous by God, by his grace, results in a new kind of life. A new relationship to sin, no longer a slave. A new relationship to law keeping. You're not married to it as if that's the way to meet God's standard. And a new relationship to God personally, a family relationship by his indwelling Holy Spirit. And God keeps his promises. It's a stunning depiction. And all of it terminates in this glory to God outburst, the end of chapter 11. What follows in Romans 12 to 15 is life under the reign of grace. You see the therefore, beginning of chapter 12, gospel, 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 and you can trust God with his promises, Romans 1 to 11. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of the mercies of God, which mercies? Everything that's been said up to chapter 11, verse 36 to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, your spiritual service of worship. And then he goes on to describe what it means to live out the Christian life. Using your gifts in the body of Christ, a Christian's relationship to governing authorities, uh, care for one another in, in weaker brothers and areas of preference, and then self-denial for the benefit of others what to do with the relationship to Paul. Again, this letter was written to the, to the Romans. I want to come to Rome. I hope to be there with you. We can establish one another in the gospel, and I want to go beyond you. I want to go where the gospel is not yet named. I wonder what it would have been like to have read this letter eagerly anticipating Paul's arrival. Hey, can we send him on? Yes, we want to help him on his way. And how did Paul show up in Rome? Do you remember? In chains. A prisoner. Maybe not what Paul expected. Maybe not what the readers would have expected. In the end, we do believe Paul made it past Rome, into Spain, uh, with the gospel, into new regions. And of course, the story continues because we're sitting here in Tempe, Arizona with the gospel and this letter. My encouragement to you is as Martin Luther's, make it part of your daily diet, some bit of Romans. Maybe I would commend to you, memorize it word for word. It is a wonderful, logical explanation of the gospel. If you can walk through Paul's argumentation, uh, you have a, a, a good way to articulate justification by faith to people who need the gospel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this letter. Thank you for preparing this unique man, the apostle to the Gentiles, who was a Jew infatuated with his own standing, his own law-keeping, his own abilities, whom you humbled. You, you brought him to the end of himself. You brought him to an abject nothingness so that he would look back on his life and all of his achievements and count them as rubbish in order that he might gain Christ. And he was blind and you made him see. And then you made him not only a trophy of your grace, but one who would suffer greatly in taking the gospel to people who would need to hear.
We pray to be like this in whatever measure you have for us in our lives, that we would know the gospel, believe the gospel, proclaim the gospel, that we would not be ashamed of the gospel. Because in the gospel is your righteousness manifest. The righteousness we so desperately needed. Given as a free gift by your grace through faith. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.